I wonder if you've ever had um, a, an item of clothing where you get that little thread. You know what I'm talking about? And it's annoying you and you want to just get rid of it. And the right thing to do, the smart thing to do, uh, is to go get a pair of scissors. I believe anyway, I'm not an expert in this. But to go get a pair of scissors to cut the thread and it's fine. But the thing you're tempted to do is just give it a little, give it a little tug, right? And then, and maybe this is just me, happened the other day with a, a coat that now needs repairing. Um, I pull in on the thread, I thought, if I just give it one yank, pull, tug, it'll come out. It did not. But I hope you, I want to give you that picture in your mind, this analogy of pulling on a thread, because you see, that's what we're going to do with Scripture. We're going to open the Word of God, and we're not going to treat this as a st series of just stories that aren't connected. We're going to see how God has been speaking and showing His character from day one. And from day one, He's been pointing to His Son, Jesus, the finished work on the cross, the empty grave, and the hope that we now have as believers. And so what a practical exercise for you, what I'd love you to do is in your Bibles, if you've got it electronically, don't worry, you're not excluded at this point. I'd love for you to go to the contents page, the contents page. And that is at the front of your Bible. And if you've got it on your phone and it doesn't have a contents page, then just you can Google list of Bible books, list of books in the Bible. That's right, you can take your phone out, get on Google. You've, you've got full permission to do this. You don't need to like be secretive about it. You don't have permission to check the lineups for the Arsenal game. That's something you can just put to one side for a moment. And uh, I'm not going to talk football because the team I support is not particularly popular at the moment. So we'll just leave that one. But the contents page of your Bible, here we go. Starts with Genesis. Hopefully you're all with me. We're not going to go through all the books, but I want to just give you a bit of a flavor. We're going to start to pull on that thread together. You see, Genesis, where God spoke the world, creation into being. God spoke and there was. And then we find these stories in Genesis of, of these great, incredible uh, people of faith. Right? We find Abraham, we find Joseph, we find the spiritual fathers. And we move on through and we get to Exodus. And by now, the people of Israel are enslaved. They, they come up against almost half a millennia of slavery and they need a, uh, they need a rescue plan. And so God sends uh, an 87-year-old man called Moses, who spent 40 years in the wilderness uh, feeling sorry for himself. Uh, and, and then one day he sees a burning bush and at 87 years old or there or thereabouts, scholars believe he's like, oh, I've got to go back. And he has a bit of a wrestle with God about it. And we go through Exodus and there's this amazing rescue. And we move through to uh, Leviticus and Numbers, which are beautiful books of the Bible. Not if you just cut them up and take them and throw them at people but if you see them in their context. You see, God had rescued a people of, he'd rescued his people, but he needed them to live not like slaves with their mindset. He needed to live as a set apart, called apart nation. And so Leviticus and Numbers is teaching a people of God how to be holy in every area of their lives. And they're going in, they're coming out. Leviticus and um, Numbers and into Deuteronomy is God showing the people of Israel, hey, you're gonna see a lot of gods. You're gonna see a lot of things that are gonna turn your heads. Stick with me. I will be your God. You will be my people. You're going to see quick fixes. You're going to see idols you can worship. You're going to see all sorts of things. I'm holy. You be holy. And so there's this huge story going on. And we come through, um, Deuteronomy gives way to Joshua. And Joshua, this leader who defeats 35 kingdoms and God's with him every step of the way. And this incredible, huge story of the people of Israel taking the promised land that's been promised to them since the, the first covenant with Abraham. And then we come through to Judges. And Judges is this time where unfortunately, the people, uh, there's no king. And it's not a great time to be alive, this 400 year period. And in Judges, uh, people are doing what they want. And, and every so often, God raises somebody up. When people look to God, He raises somebody up to save and to bring uh, justice and restoration. But then all of it, it, the cycle goes on again. Why am I going through the Bible like this? Some of you are like, oh my goodness, there's 66 books. Who is this guy? Right, because look at what comes after Judges. Ruth. I was waiting for somebody to shout it out. I was just checking I hadn't missed any of the books out, right? Ruth, Ruth. Suddenly we go from this huge story, this huge narrative of, of, of just God doing incredible things or whole people groups falling away from Him and coming back. And then the Bible zooms in very intentionally on one family. 
for four chapters. Zooms all the way in. And then Ruth is followed by Samuel. First Samuel, second Samuel, first Kings, second Kings, which is again Saul and David and the exploits of these great men of God, right? And Goliath is killed. And then Chronicles, which we believe Ezra wrote. And it's a retelling of Kings and it's uh, calling the people to worship and so on and so forth. But Ruth, there it is, four little chapters in the middle, in the middle of these huge narratives. What is it doing there? And I'd love to bring a message this morning on the book of Ruth. As we just start to pull on the thread of scripture, we see that Ruth isn't some randomly placed story that we just pull off the shelf. God, it's always intentional. And there it is, nestled after the book of Judges. So we're gonna get into Ruth. So you can turn in your Bible to the book of Ruth. Told you exactly where it is. Uh, You you can read through it in about 15 minutes. So that's not a bad A bad thing to do once you've gone home later today because I believe God, you know, this is not just a history lesson. In fact, I'd hate for it to be a history lesson. I want God to speak to you. I want God to speak to me. And so Ruth starts like this. Let's have some context. Verse one, chapter one. In the days when the judges ruled. Okay, so we know when Ruth is happening in that sort of 400 year period. There was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi and the names of his first two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah and they went to Moab and lived there. Okay, don't switch off. Sometimes in the Bible we see names and we don't really know what the names are. They're not names we call each other now. I've never met somebody called Elimelech. You may have. Names are important. Names root us in story. Places are important, they root us in a story. See, this isn't just some random time that, okay, God's gonna do something. No, no. Let's see what he's actually up to. You see, if you look just on the page before, you've got the last page of Judges, right? I'm gonna hold it up. Sorry, there's things that will fall out of it. My children give me drawings on a Sunday and they all end up in my Bible. So I don't wanna decorate the stage. But here we go. The last verse of Judges, have a look at it with me. It says this, Judges 21 verse 25. This is the verse that sets up the book of Ruth, okay? It says this, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And in fact, if you read Judges, you will see all the way through the book of Judges, it's in uh, chapter 17, 6, chapter 18, 1, chapter 19, 1. It says, there was no king, everyone did what was right, in his own eyes. Now I know we had a king coronated yesterday, okay? But do you, do you see some of the parallels here? Everyone did what was, they thought was fit in their own eyes. This was the land that Ruth was set in. There's some parallels to us here today. Another refrain all the way through the book of Judges is this. It says, uh, and the people of Israel did evil in God's sight. Judges 2, 11, 3, 12, 4, 4, 1, 6, 1, all the way through the book these two refrains. That's the land that Ruth starts in. And here we go, actually, we see it already. See, Elimelech was, a, was from Bethlehem. He's, he's part of the tribe of Judah. He was an Israelite called out to the promised land. Joshua had fought his way through kingdom after kingdom to get them and then distributed the land in, in Cana amongst them. And look what Elimelech was doing. There was famine. And so a man from Bethlehem did exactly what Judges said. He did what was right in his own eyes. He went to live for a while in the country of Moab. You see, to get to Moab, uh, Elimelech and Naomi and the family would have had to go back through the Jericho Pass. They would have had to go back through the Judean wilderness next to the Dead Sea. And they'd have had to go back across the Jordan River. Literally, they'd have to retrace the steps that God had miraculously provided back to the land of Moab. And Moab was significant because it was a pagan land. Again, another instruction in God helping his people be a holy people was don't take wives. Don't settle amongst pagan lands. I'm calling you to the promised land. And so they went back and and their sons, and we read this in Ruth in the next verse, they married Moabite women, pagan, multi-God people. Okay? This was the setting. Elimelech did what was right in his own eyes. Instead of trusting God, there was no food in the land. 
And if you read Deuteronomy, it, God says that when, you, when you're far from me, the land's not gonna be blessed in the way that it is when you're close to me. And so Elimelech went back and Naomi with him and there were steps in the wrong direction. And we see what happens. Verse three, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah. I read that as Oprah for at least the first five times. And the other, Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Marlon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. 10 years of tragedy, pain, hardship, death in Moab. And here's where I'm gonna give you a little synopsis of the book because we're not gonna go through it that slowly. I'd love to, but I'm gonna give you a little synopsis of what happens so that I can fit some of the other stuff in along the way. You see, after this time, Naomi had a choice. Her husband had died, her sons had died. And in those days, that was huge, still huge, but it's huge because she was a widow. She was too old to bear children. She became literally the bottom of the pile of society. When it came to her rights, her land, she had nothing. But she goes back. If you read verse six, Naomi made a plan to go back. And she returns to Bethlehem in Judah. And everybody in Bethlehem knows her there. You'll see in chapter two, we'll come to it. They said, could this be Naomi? Why does she go back? Because she hears that God is doing something. She hears that there's food again in Bethlehem. So she goes back and Orpah decides to stay in, in the land of Moab with her family. And although Naomi says to Ruth, you should probably stay here too, because these aren't your people. You were not going to be welcomed back in Bethlehem. You're a Moab widow. People are going to talk. Ruth sticks with her. They go back to Bethlehem and Naomi goes into the town. And what happens is Ruth and Naomi, although there's food, they have to start at the bottom of the pile because they are widows. They have no inheritance, no land. And so they work hard. Ruth goes out into the fields each day. And what she does is she gleans, which means you're allowed near the edge of the field. You're allowed to pick up what's left. In fact, in Leviticus, it was the first social justice plan initiated by God. He said, look, leave the margins. And if you drop stuff, just leave it because that's how the people with nothing are gonna have a dignified approach to providing for themselves. That's in Leviticus, okay? So they have to glean and they have to work hard. And eventually what happens is there's a man in Bethlehem called Boaz. And he is what's called, uh, he's, a chief, he's a chieftain, but the word is Goel. And he's actually related to Naomi's husband, Elimelech, who passed away. And in those days, uh, there was within Jewish, within Israelite law, what happened was uh, that the, the Goel the re could redeem, could actually buy back, could actually reinstate the inheritance if you'd lost your husband. There was this clause basically that allowed people who'd suffered tragedy to still have the dignity of rights restored. And what happens is he ends up marrying Ruth and the story there then basically ends with Ruth and Boaz are married. He redeems the family name, gets the land back that should be rightfully Naomi's through her husband and they have a child. There's the book of Ruth. We can all go home. Except this isn't a history lesson, is it? We meet some very uh, real people in this book. We meet some very real characters and the, really the three of them we're gonna focus on are uh, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Naomi, we, we see already, don't we, in, in chapter one, verse six, when I said, Naomi heard in Moab what the Lord had done, th that he'd come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home. So the first thing we see is that Naomi hears that God's doing something back in Judah. She could have stayed in Moab, right? Oh, that's good for them, but the God's, God's been um, tough on me and I just need to stay here and suffer. Her testimony is often, you know, the, God has caused me to suffer. She doesn't blame God. She just says, look, we've, we've done wrong in his sight and this is why all this bad stuff happened. But she doesn't. She goes back and it's very significant. She goes back and she says to the townspeople when they say, look, isn't this Naomi? In chapter two, verse one, uh, they, they say, she says to him, uh, the, the, the townspeople, sorry, sorry, chapter one, verse 20. Don't call me Naomi, she says. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. So Naomi, we start to see some of her character. We start to see the relationship between her and her daughters-in-law. Look what happens when she decides to go back. She says, I'm gonna go back to um, 
to Bethlehem home, but she releases her daughters-in-law. In verse one, chapter one, verse eight, may the Lord show you kindness as you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant each of you will find rest, basically, whether you'll find another husband. And Ruth does something significant because she starts to show her character. In fact, it says twice that they weep aloud together. There's this bond that's come between Naomi and Ruth and Orpah. They wept loudly. This is a really tough moment where Naomi's saying, I'm going back, but you shouldn't come. And what happens is, is that, that Ruth makes this speech to Naomi and it's a very significant speech which shows us some of Ruth's character. So we see a, a repentant Naomi. We see Naomi willing to come back, releasing her daughters-in-law. Really, the really only sport she has she says, you guys should stay here. And this is what Ruth says to her. Ruth says, it says, but Ruth clung to her, verse 15 of chapter one. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Hope you're still with me. Ruth, the Moab, the pagan, multi-God, makes a statement to Naomi and says, your people be my people. That's huge, but even bigger. Hey, I've seen enough about your life. I've never, Ruth's never been to Bethlehem, but she's seen enough about the life of Naomi to say this, your God will be my God. Through the 10 years of, char- of tragedy, Ruth doesn't make that statement, but in Ru- Naomi's willingness to go back by putting... Ruth and Orpah first, Ruth's like, no, I'm not, I'm sticking around. And we start to see this beautiful characteristic of Ruth, of this servant-hearted woman of God. And in fact, what happens, she becomes a woman of God. She doesn't even know it because she doesn't know God, but she makes a decision. Your God will be my God. And as they go back in Ruth, it says she becomes known for her servant character. She works hard. She doesn't just uh, demand her rights. She doesn't sit feeling sorry for herself. It says frequently, Ruth gets up early to glean and she works very hard. And it just so happens that she comes upon the field of Boaz. It says in the Bible, as it turned out, so it was not something that was planned. She happens into the field of Boaz and we meet Boaz. And Boaz, he quickly establishes himself to us uh, as a man of God. You see, Boaz, the first time we meet him in chapter two, it says this, um, verse six, sorry, verse four. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. See, Boaz, straight away we see, hang on, this isn't a man like Elimelech. This isn't a man who's just doing his own thing in his own sight. This is a man who greets his workers and they cheerfully greet him back. This is a man who treats people right. In fact, he goes on to be very kind to Ruth and Boaz when he learns their situation. We don't know at this point whether he knows the connection. That's unclear. But he's very generous. He's very kind. And so all the harvest long, he even says to his men, hey, leave some extra sheaves out for Ruth as she gleans. He gives her that dignity, but she is able to collect. And so we see Boaz's character. We see Naomi, repentant, coming home. We see Ruth putting Naomi first even when she could have stayed in Moab. And we see Boaz showing kindness without return. These are the characters we meet in Ruth. And we come to this chapter, this episode, where Ruth and Naomi, Naomi said, look, Ruth, I want to provide for you. By the way, Boaz is our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. He's related to Elimelech, which means if you were to marry him, he would be able to buy back and restore the land and have children and carry on the family name. Naomi doesn't force Ruth, but she says, look, this is, the, this is a potential for redemption here. And so we have this, this scene where, where Ruth readies herself and she presents herself as intending to marry Boaz. And what, what that means is she goes at, at night and she lays at his feet. This was Israelite custom and she uncovers his feet. It's a very simple, just very humble gesture that says, hey, I'm coming seeking permission to be your wife and, and to be you to be our redeemer. And Boaz is lying on the floor. This is in Ruth chapter three and he's guarding The threshing floor. Remember, it's the land of the time of the judges. So everybody's doing what they want, right? So why is Boaz sleeping there? Because he's expecting to be woken up by thieves, murderers, robbers. They've harvested all season long. He's got to know Ruth as somebody who gleans in his fields. He's shown kindness to her. But there's this incident that happens 
in Ruth chapter three. It says this, in the middle of the night, something startled the man, that's Boaz. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. Right, he's just woken up. Who are you, Ruth? I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are the guardian redeemer of our family. Here's this woman he's noticed all summer who's younger than him who I think he's grown to be attracted to. And he's interrupted. I believe this, I read this quote and I just want to pause on this. Boaz is interrupted. You know, C.S. So C.S. Lewis is a famous author, theologian. He, he said this quote, which always just stops me whenever I read it. He says, how you respond to an interruption is who you actually are. See, Boaz could have woken up angry and well, what's going on? He doesn't. He wakes up with kindness. Do you know Jesus spent most of his time in the Gospels being interrupted? He didn't really plan his days, but people just came up. Hey, if you're this, do this. The Pharisees tried to catch him. He was interrupted a lot. C.S. Lewis goes on. He says this. The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life life. The life God is sending one day by day. This is important because Bo what Boaz does with the interruption unlocks the rest of the story. You see, he could have, once Ruth says, I'll be your wife, he could have forced himself on her. That would have been okay within the day, you know. People would do what they want, remember? But he didn't. In fact, he even says to her, wow, blessed are you. And he says, you know, there's, there's, there's younger men you could have gone after. Uh, You've not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. But he says this, yes, I am a guarding redeemer of your family, of our family, but there's one who's closer that we need to ask his permission first. Wow. Here's this woman who's presented herself, I'd like to marry you to bear children, to carry in the family name. He, in the middle of the night, being interrupted, this is showing some character, doesn't say, yep, okay, I'm in. He says, there's actually somebody we need to check this over with first because they're closer. He does the right thing by her and by God. And fast forward, they do get married and they have a child. And so now we've, doesn't know, don't know, we don't just know the story of Ruth, we know some of the characters involved. I hope you're still with me. And we pull on that thread a little bit more. God, why do we know these things about these characters? Why Ruth? Why this seemingly little story nestled in the middle of the Old Testament among the huge narrative? God, what are you saying to us here today, May 7th, 2023? God, we don't just want to go home and on the tube or the train say, oh, I didn't know that about Ruth, that's interesting. It's not what we want. We want to hear from you. Do you believe, church, that when God says, this isn't the God, word of God, it says that God is the same God yesterday, today, forever. The same God that was speaking then speaks now. The same God who was watching and seeing what was going on in this little town of Bethlehem He's watching now. Why do I say that? Well, because let's look at Jesus. Jesus in John 13 says this. He gives a new commandment to his disciples just before he goes to his death. He's just washed their feet, which is the most humble act of serving. He's showing them what love in action is. He's washed all of their feet, including Judas. He's washed his feet too, knowing what's gonna happen. That's this scene. Jesus is going to the cross. He's washed the feet of his disciples. He said, this is what love is. Even Judas, who's gonna betray me, this is what love is. And then he says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you love one another, he stresses it. And I've thought about this. Jesus, why this commandment? Could have said anything. New commandment, tell everyone about Jesus. A new commandment, preach the gospel. A new commandment, give to the poor. A new commandment, he says, love one another. Same God, pulling the thread, yesterday, today, forever. You see, when we look at the story of Ruth, we don't just see a historical, nice little story of, of, of family knit together. When we look at the story of Ruth, we see stories entwined together. We see Naomi, 
putting Ruth and Orpah first in a difficult journey. I'm going back to my home that I left pretty much in disgrace. But you girls, you do what's right by you. I'm going back. We see Naomi find redemption in the story, right? Because actually both Ruth and Boaz get married and they have a son and her name is restored. We see Ruth constantly serving. We see Ruth loving on others. And we see Ruth becoming known as, Boaz even says, everyone in the town says you're of noble character. Ruth doesn't go and complain. She works hard. God sees it. And look what happens. Boaz putting Ruth first, getting the girl of his dreams. You see, I believe... There's this link. I believe one of the reasons Jesus says when you love one another, this is the new commandment I give you. This is the sort of atmosphere when we love one another. Not just love, but as as I have loved you. This is the sort of atmosphere that God can move and do something not just significant, but extraordinary. To unlock in this sort of atmosphere, a move of God. You see, there was a move of God In Ruth, they didn't know it, but they were part of something extraordinary. You see, if you look at the end of Ruth in chapter four, when the baby's been born and and Naomi's holding this baby and all the women of the town are saying, Naomi, look, you came back saying bitter and don't call me Naomi, but look, you're gonna be blessed by this. Your inheritance is restored. And Naomi holds her grandson in her arms. It's this beautiful verse. Verse 16 of Ruth 4. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. Verse 17. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, but don't miss this. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. You see, when God looks down and he sees people who even in a time when everyone's doing their own thing, who put each other first in a way that is sacrificial, who would come together and say, I could do this like Boaz and I could take you, but we're gonna do it the right way. It unlocks something in his character. Same God, yesterday, today, forever. Same times, everyone doing what they want but a group of people going, no, God, we're gonna do the right thing. We're gonna do this your way. And it unlocked something extraordinary. You see, from Ruth came King David. And if you read Matthew's gospel, Ruth's name is included there. as only one of five women, I believe, in the genealogy of Jesus. God didn't just do something in her life. He used her story to redeem history. Jesus. You can go read it there in Matthew 1. You see, this is how our God works and this is the ridiculous, incredible thing. When we come together, when we love one another, when we say we're gonna be a people who stick together in the hard time, that don't run off. We're gonna be a people who are gonna be generous. We're gonna leave the margins of our field and we're gonna leave some more sheaths on the floor so that people can be blessed by our lives. We're gonna be a people who console one another, who weep together when it's tough and it's sad, but who celebrate together when there's joy. This is the environment we see in Ruth and this is the church that Jesus Jesus has called us to be. That's the new commandment, that you would love one another as I have loved you, that you'd be ready to, you know, wash each other's feet. Now, metaphorically as well, what does that mean? It means get down in the dirty of each other's lives. Whether people deserve it or not, Jesus washed the feet of Judas. And God looks at that and he says, hey, I can partner this. I can partner with this. You see, Naomi's decision to go back to Bethlehem in Ruth 1 verse 6, guess what that led to? Well, we know at Christmas time we do the story of Jesus. In fact, we fill out this incredible theatre watching it. Where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because Naomi went back. If Naomi had never gone back, that part of the story wouldn't be there, right? God, this is not how God moves. Naomi went back. She could have stayed in Moab, but she went back. She heard that God was doing something again in her homeland. She could have stayed, gone another way, felt sorry. She doesn't take it out on God. She says, I'm gonna go back. She goes back desperate. But because she went back, Jesus was born in Bethlehem because you see Mary and Joseph had to return to their home town, census taken. And where was that? It was Bethlehem. Why? Because that's where Obed was born, Jesse, David, all the way through. So God, how does he work? Well, look, he's redeeming the individual story. 
in Ruth. Naomi doesn't know any of this, what I've just told you. She doesn't know Jesus is going to come from her line in inheritance. He's redeeming her story as she just puts Ruth first, as she puts Orpah first. God is then redeeming the story of this town, of this, of this people, of his people. And at the same time, he's redeeming the whole of human history, all in the same story. And he's speaking to you here today. He saw you in your seat here in the Dominion the same way he saw Naomi make the decision to come back to Bethlehem. You see, he's the same God, right? Pull on the thread. Yesterday, in the time of Judges, when it was desperate and everyone did what they wanted, he's the same God now. He sees you. He knew you'd be here. He, I'd be here. But are you listening? Do you have ears? Do you want to hear? Or do you just want to read? He's the same God who wants that intimacy. And he's the same God who's redeeming, rescuing human history. How did he do that? He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and to rise again from the dead. And so, and the, the team can join me in. This is where I want to land with this. Uh, there's this quote I love. It's by a guy called Bob Goff. He, he spoke at Colour a little while ago. He's an incredible encourager. Incredible encourager. He says this, God doesn't pass us notes. He gives us each other. Isn't that beautiful? God, he gives us each other. Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, now, who have you got? Who are you to someone else? See, I believe we can find ourselves in the story. I believe we can all find ourselves in the story and trust in God that he's gonna, as it says in Romans 8, 28, that he works all things for the good, right? We don't see what's going on. Ruth and Naomi would never have known about Jesse and the line carried on, but they trusted. That's okay. You don't know the impact that your life's gonna have, that this church is gonna have through generations. And that's the beautiful mystery of following God. John Piper, another quote that I love, he said this, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life and you may be aware of three of them. Love that, right? Isn't there comfort in the awesomeness, bigness of God? God gives us this tiny story in the middle of huge stories, not so that we're overawed by the bigness of God. We, we're just scared into humility. God, we're so small, you're so big, do what you want. No, God gives us the story of Ruth in the midst of these huge stories to say, look, yes, you are small, but look how precious you are to me. David got this when he wrote in the Psalms and he said, you know, the kingdoms and the heavens are so high and who is man that you would look at him and who is man that you would even consider him? And sometimes that's wrongly interpreted to mean that God's dismissive of man and we just need to kind of be fatalistic. But it's not that at all. When you read in Isaiah, it says, your ways are higher, uh, my ways are higher, my thoughts are larger than yours. And we, again, we can take that to mean, okay, God, just do what you want. And I'm just down here, a little ant on the floor. It's not what it means. Because if you read the next verse of that chapter in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 55, it says, my ways are not your ways. The next verse talks about how much God loves us. That verse is not about God being big, us being small. Ruth being in the Bible is not about him being big, us being small. It's about how much he cares for us in our story. Same God, yesterday, today, forever. So we're gonna sing a song in just a moment. In fact, why don't we stand to our feet, if you're able to. I'd love for you to join me in that. You see, I believe God has started to speak to some of you. That's why I haven't given my message a title today because I believe in this room there's hundreds of individual titles where God is showing you an element of the story. I believe that for some of us here today, we're resonating a bit with Boaz. Yeah, okay, I, I, th I think God's maybe prompting me to make some more room in my life. Who's He sending my way? Who are the Ruths and the Naomi's that are coming across my doorstep and I don't see them because I'm preoccupied with, God, we're gonna do this for you. What's the commandment? Don't do this for me. Love one another as I have loved you. So who is it that God's bringing in? You just need to leave some margin in your life. You need to leave some sheaths on the floor. So maybe that's you today. You feel resonating with this story of Boaz. Maybe you're resonating with Ruth and Naomi. 
in need of a Redeemer. You see, the beautiful thing is that this story doesn't just point to Jesus in Matthew, it shows Jesus in Ruth. You see, Boaz is this picture of Jesus. Jesus was both our kinsman, one of us, and our Redeemer. If Jesus had stayed in heaven, He wouldn't have been our kinsman and our Redeemer. He'd have just been our Redeemer. But no, He came. He came to be our kinsman. If God had just raised up a a really awesome person to be our kinsman, He couldn't have been our Redeemer because He wasn't pure, spotless, holy. And so Jesus came as our kinsman, Redeemer. Same that Boaz was for Ruth. He, He was then, He is now. And so as we sing this song, would it, let it be to us a prayer. There's a line in here, this is your, my inheritance. Let that be a statement over your, I'm not just saying your finances, I'm saying your legacy. Your legacy in this church, in this world, in your family. And we're gonna talk about you, I've never walked alone. Let that be a statement of intent as we sing. We're gonna say, you go before me. Let that be your prayer. God wants to speak to you, friend, here, today, same God, yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. Let's sing together and then I'd love to pray for you.